which brings us to the situation. Verse 9 through 18. It's that very famous passage in Romans 3 where Paul gives us the most bleak, the most bleak diagnosis of the human condition. That none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, and no one seeks God. All have turned aside, and so on and so forth. This is the big crescendo of this section of Romans. This is the section where Paul gets to the point that in short, it does not matter if you are Jew or Gentile or rich or poor or black or white or good or bad. Before a righteous and holy judge outside of Christ, the judgment is always the same, that no one is righteous. No, not one. No one does good. And so what does that mean? It means that is what that what's wrong with the world does not exist out there. The problem is not out there. But according to Romans 3, 9 through 18, where is the problem? It's here. It's the mirror. I'm the problem. That's Paul's point. That our greatest problem, our greatest problem is not the situation that we are born into. Our greatest problem is not the community in which we live. Our greatest problem is not our mommy and daddy wounds or the family that we have been raised in. And that isn't to undermine that all of those things can have challenges. But according to Romans 3, what's our greatest problem? It's the sin that we are under. That's our greatest problem. And practically speaking, even if all the conditions are good and right... You can't condition sin out of people. You can't condition sin out of people's hearts. People cannot be morally conditioned to improve on their sinful status because simple behavior modification does not change hearts. This is why, after how many centuries of civilization, we still have prisons. Does this mean that everybody's sinful as they can be? Well, certainly not. But what Romans 3 tells us is that the world does not make us sin. Rather, it is we as people that bring sin into the world. The world does not make us sin. It is us as people that bring sin into the world. It's like the cookie jar analogy. You eat the entire sleeve of Oreos or Fig Newtons, right? Right? The cookies didn't grow legs and crawl their way into your belly. You ate them. Two cookies. And so what's the problem in the world today? Us. We are the problem. And that's the crystal clear portion of that scripture. That as people, we're not inherently good. Meaning we're not born as good people who unfortunately make bad decisions or bad choices. This passage tells us that we as people are born under sin, that we are born in bondage to the world, to the flesh, to the devil, as 1 John puts it. 
Paul gives us this bleak picture, right? This is really depressing. I feel like I'm saddening everybody for the past few weeks. But he gives us this bleak picture. Why? Like, why does he do this? Why does he dismantle us, if you will? Because here's the thing, until you feel the weight, until you feel the weight of your own sinfulness, until you feel the weight of your own depravity, then you will never yearn for something or someone to save you from it. Until you feel the weight of your own sinfulness or depravity, then you will never yearn for something or someone to save you from it. Because if we continually operate with the mindset that we're basically good, if we operate with the mindset that we're basically good people, then what will we do? We will just try to improve on what's within rather than look for something outside to be saved. And so Paul, in Romans 1 to 3, he has systematically worked through and undressed the entire notion that our fundamental need as people is not to be freed from God and His ways, nor is it tried to earn or merit God's love and acceptance by our own works. But Romans 3 is this declaration that we are not inherently good as people who sometimes do bad things. Nor are we merely bad people who just need to get their acts together. Romans 3 says the problem goes deep down into our hearts to such a degree that we constantly sin in either trying to run away from God or by trying to manipulate Him to love us by our own behavior. And so if that's the objection and the situation, then where then is the hope? Why take three chapters to say this? Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This is what Paul has been working up to. This is what he's been working up to. This whole idea of how God's law functions within our hearts and lives. How God's commands function within our hearts and lives. God's righteousness, God's holiness, God's perfection as displayed in the law, when it's understood rightly, what does it do? It crushes. God's law was not given that we would run from it like those in Romans 1, nor was God's law given that we might use it to build a ladder to God like many of the Jews in Romans 2. But rather, God's law, what does it do? It reveals. It is the mirror, right? This is one of the uses, one of the functions of the law. That it is a mirror, it reveals to us our sin. And as we stand before the mirror of God's law, what does it do? It exposes. It exposes your heart. Paul says in this section, it's like the law reaches out and it grabs your mouth and says, Stop talking. Stop. Verse 20 gives us this great understanding of how the law works. It reveals the knowledge of our sin. The law reveals to us just how truly 
bent in on ourselves that we are. That no one understands. That no one seeks God. That no one does good, not even one. R.J. Grunewald, he's a pastor, he says it like this. Sin is the disease. It's the infection and corruption of the human heart. The heart which should run to God, rather runs to created things. The heart corrupted by sin fears and it loves and it trusts in anything but God. Listen how he says that again. The heart that is corrupted by sin fears, loves, and trusts in anything but God. The human condition is having a heart corrupted by sin. Our hearts have been turned inward on themselves since the fall, and this corruption creates havoc in our lives. And so how is this hopeful? How is this life-giving? Because here's the thing. Without God's law, and without truly understanding just how deep the rabbit hole of our sin goes, without that, you will never yearn for a Savior You will never yearn for Christ. Feeling the weight of God's law to the point of being crushed by it is actually a good thing because it's then and it's only then that you are primed to hear the gospel. It's then and only then that you're ready to hear things like even though Like Romans 1, even though you have chased and worshipped created things, Christ Jesus has chased you and has died in your place. Even though you have spent time and energy trying to merit God's love and favor through your own works, your own moralism, Christ Jesus did that perfectly and died in your place. Even though you have not sought after God, even though you have not understood His ways, and even though you have not done any good, Christ Jesus sought you, and He died for you. The gospel is not that we have readied ourselves for God in order to receive it, but rather the gospel is that Christ found us in our law-breaking and deadness and still died in our place to give us life. The purity and the joy of the gospel comes into our hearts when we realize just how needy we are and we don't deserve it and yet how radically and graciously God still gives us forgiveness and life in our unworthiness, right? This is what we saw earlier. This is what we read earlier in Romans 5a. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so here's the thing. For, For you today, You might not be overtly in your mind in a place of worshiping idols. Like most likely, like if I like snuck into your house, open your closet, I'm not going to find like, you know, I don't know, Buddha in there that you've like bowed down to. You might not even systematically, overtly be trying to earn God's favor. But I will tell you this. Our hearts do plenty of fearing and loving and trusting a lot of things other than Christ, do they not? Because our temptation might not be idol worship in the closet. 
our temptation might be numbing ourselves. Our temptation might not be trying to earn God's favor by obeying everything perfectly. Our temptation might be that what we, what we do is we look at our progress of our life. Am I better today than I was 10 years ago? And, and if the answer is yes, well then good, I have assurance before God. And if it's not, then I'm in despair. Our temptation might believe might be to believe that God's blessing and affection only come when we obey Him. Our temptation might be to believe or to go into despair because we don't feel or fight as we once did in the Christian life. In all of these cases, it's really easy to have what's called a legal spirit. A legal spirit meaning, I do this and God pays me this. Or I do this and God returns this to me. But if we're honest, the doing is never done, right? The doing is never done. Martin Luther said it like this, the law says do this and it's never done. The law says do this and it's never done. If you've ever seen Schindler's List, there's a guy at the end of the movie and he's given a lot to help the Jews in the Holocaust. And at the end of the movie, he's pulling out his teeth for the gold to melt it down, to help. And one of his things that he keeps saying is, I, I should have done more. I should have done more. I wish I would have done more. The law says do this and it's never done. But grace says, believe this. And it's already done. What that means is God's law and gospel says to us, right? The two words of God, God's law and God's gospel says to us, stop talking. I love you. I have died for you. And I have made you mine. God's law shuts our mouths so that God's gospel may open our hearts to receive Christ and his grace. Romans 3, 1 to 20, it doesn't want your excuses for your sin. Because no excuse is good enough. Romans 1, 3 to 20 says, no, lay down your excuses. Lay down your sins. And lay down your good works. That Christ would be the one who lifts your head. That Christ would give you his life that Christ would give you His peace and His forgiveness. And as we close this morning, I think there's words from a hymn that perfectly summarize this idea. It says, Not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Perhaps that's how you feel sometimes. That it's my prayers and sighs and tears that I try to bear my own load. But the hymnist says this, Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to Thee, can rid me of this dark unrest. 
and set my spirit free. You know, I've said this multiple times, that I think one of the fundamental battles of the Christian life is just recognizing that God loves you. It's just recognizing that God understands and forgives. It's just recognizing and resting in His promise that He really has paid your debt. I don't know if it's like the Minnesota nice in us, right? We don't like to receive compliments or have people service serve us. You know, we write thank you notes for receiving a thank you note kind of thing. But it's thy work alone, O Christ, that can ease this weight of sin. You know, maybe you look at God and say, yeah, well, I I just thought I'd be better by now. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. For it's easy, my burden is light. Maybe you say, yeah, but I still struggle with this. Right, I know. That's why I died. That's why I didn't say, tag, you're it. And maybe you say, but I'm just not sure that I don't have to do something. And I think Jesus would say, we'll get there. We'll get there. Trust me. Rest in me. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee. That's the posture of the Christian life. Is looking to God's love for us and resting in that, not our love to him. Can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. God's law shuts our mouths that his gospel may open our hearts to receive, trust, and rest in Christ. Let's pray. And so God, we thank you that Romans 3 exposes us. It exposes our human condition that there is no one righteous, no, not one, no one does good and no one seeks after God and that's why we look to you in the gospel which says even though that is true Christ comes to seek after us that even in our seasons of spiritual maturity and spiritual growth it is still Christ our righteousness and even in our seasons of spiritual lackluster feelings and and spiritual uh, uh, lack that that it is that is Christ is our righteousness. May we rest in that this morning. We thank you for your love and your kindness that leads us to repentance. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.